his quality the divine eye. Hi there. So when I was struggling to define spiritual, and this was in Paul Vanderclay's conversation that we had a couple months ago, um, I realized I'm uncomfortable with that word. There's something that seems incomplete about it. It seems to have a sort of passivity. And so I think the other word that complements it is numinous. Numinous has a very profound implication. It is horror and awe. And I think perhaps in combination, these two words are a close description of what I meant. There's more of a completeness when you think about this all together. And the distinction and unification of these two terms might be important. Is that something like God 1 and 2? Well, we'll look at that in a moment. But first, let's bring Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance into this. So you could argue that the mountain in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and there's many instances of it, I'm going to discuss uh, a, a spiritual uh, aspect of it in Chapter 7 tomorrow. Um, the numinous... The numinous experience of the mountain is, again, horror and awe. It is something that can fortify us or destroy us. The mountain in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is the place where feeders live, because as they go up in the elevation, that's when the memories of feeders start coming back to the narrator. And it is in the mountains that feeders reaches the highest awesome inspiration that will elevate his understanding. Um, of reality to the highest peaks of consciousness. And this is a shift, in, a metaphysical shift, and that shift is what precipitates his descent into madness. Awe and horror. So in John 34, I'm sorry, that might be a little sacrilegious, but I couldn't resist. John Verveke, episode 34, the description of the numin numinous is um, is something like you can't ever see God because if you do, you'll be destroyed. And the experience is outside the realm of any possibility of categorization. It is no context. It's unintelligible. And the loss of intelligibility to us is horror. It's like the bottom falling out of your world. That horrible moment uh, is when, or after that horrible moment, you can either restructure your hold in reality or you can be destroyed. And we've heard this spoken about before. This is um, Jordan Peterson talks about it in these terms. So when you go down, uh, when you go down to the depths, you can either bring back the gold or you can um, perish forever. And the horrific aspect is described by Paul Vanderclay in his last video, which is great. Um, he, he, just, he compares it to shell shock. It's an apt description. Another excellent description of this whole phenomenon is in the chapter uh, is in chapter 11 of the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and the Bhagavad Gita is a poem within the big, the larger poem of the Mahabharata, which is the epic poem of Indian mythology. And it is a, um, like, like all epic poems, it's a, a great battle in which you know, the, the history, the, the uh, trajectory of the universe is going to be determined, or of the world. And as usual in these archetypal battles, on both sides are family members, and in the middle is the prince, Arjuna, and he has to figure out what to do, because whatever he does, his family is going to be demolished. So it's a real dilemma. So he happens to have a very uh, intelligent and wise is the better word, charioteer. And it turns out that this charioteer is much more than a servant. He ends up being the Supreme Lord Krishna. And in this, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is, is the Lord, is God, is the, um, the, the uh, cosmic, is the, is the one. So after some discourse in this, um, in this poem, Arjuna asked, realizes who his servant is, and he asked to see the true face of Krishna. So I'm going to read some of this chapter 11. I'm actually going to read a lot of it. O Krishna, I have heard from you in detail about the origin and dissolution of beings and your imperishable glory. O Lord, 
You are as you have said, yet I wish to see your divine cosmic form, O Supreme Being. O Lord, if you think it is possible for me to see this, then, O Lord of the yogis, show me your imperishable self. The Supreme Lord said, O Arjuna, behold my hundreds and thousands of multifarious divine forms of different colors and shapes. See the Adityas, the Vasus, the Rudras, the Ashvins, and the Maruts. Behold, O Arjuna, many wonders never seen before. O Arjuna, now behold the entire creation, animate, inanimate, and whatever else you like, all at one place in my body. But you are not able to see me with your physical eye. Therefore, I give you the divine eye to see my majestic power and glory. O king, having said this, Lord Krishna, the great lord of the mystic power of yoga, revealed his supreme majestic form to Arjuna. Arjuna saw the universal form of the Lord with many mouths and eyes and many visions of marvel, with numerous divine ornaments and holding divine weapons, wearing divine garlands and apparel, anointed with celestial perfumes and ointments, full of all wonders, the limitless God with faces on all sides. If the splendor of thousands of suns were to blaze forth all at once in the sky, even that would not resemble the splendor of, the, of that exalted being. Arjuna saw the entire universe divided in many ways, but standing as all in one and one in all in the body of Krishna, God of gods. So here is some of Arjuna's response. Then Arjuna, filled with wonder and his hair standing on end, bowed his head to the Lord and prayed with folded hands. Arjuna said, O Lord, I see in your body all the gods and multitude of beings, all sages, celestial serpents, Lord Shiva as well as Lord Brahma, Seated on the lotus, O Lord of the universe, I see you everywhere with infinite form, with many arms, stomachs, faces, and eyes. Neither do I see the beginning, nor the middle, nor the end of your universal form. I see you with your crown, club, discus, and mass of radiance, difficult to behold, shining all around with immeasurable brilliance of the sun and the blazing fire. I believe you are the imperishable, the supreme to be realized. You are the ultimate resort of the universe. You are the protector of eternal dharma and the imperishable primal spirit. I see you with, the, with infinite power, without beginning, middle, or end, with many arms, with the sun and the moon as your eyes, with your mouth as a blazing fire whose radiance is scorching all the universe. The entire space between heaven and earth is pervaded by you alone in all directions, seeing your marvelous and terrible form. The t three worlds are trembling with fear, O Lord marvelous and terrible. In traditional in, uh, Indian religious art, and it's interesting because traditional Indian religious art is, is um, similar to icons in a way because the way that the uh, event is depicted is always the same and there's a style to the art that is very similar and there's it's, it's kind of for us it's kind of um, let's just say kind of sweet and it's a little jarring. So here is a, um, here's a depiction in traditional Indian art of that experience. But the, here is another depiction of that experience and this is from the great cartoon history of the universe which I highly recommend and look at this depiction. So that's interesting. You can see awe and you can see horror in the two depictions. You can see something that creates the good, the true, and the beautiful, and something that destroys everything. And here's, here's a picture of poor Arjuna after that. So as of this video, I haven't seen John Verveke's number 35, so I don't know if he's going to address this, and I kind of want to uh, talk about this first because I will be influenced by it. So I, I just want to go into this with my raw understanding at this point. So, so what's interesting is the book of Job, and I want to talk about Jung's interpretation of it. Um, and this is my understanding of Jung's interpretation, is that God changes in the book of Job from a archaic, numinous, numinous God who fills us with horror and awe from a maker under whose eye one trembles. I got that from, from um, Paul Vanderclay. To one that we participated with in agape. 
And how does this happen? It's because Job actually sees during this, this exchange, this um, demonstration of God's power, Job starts to see what's missing. And what's missing in the old God, um, Job actually helps God to learn how to love. It was that kind of agape that was missing. I know that sounds sacrilegious, but is it? I mean, God is still there. What is updating is the perception of God. That perception needs transformation. So consciousness is updating, and this is happening, I think, it's happening now, too. In Job, the God of the New Testament is ushered in, and that God is the one that Mary Kohans put so beautifully in her excellent first video, uh, a God that we can fall in love with. So in Mary's second video, she describes the reason science doesn't explain God away. Um, well, she, she says that, that science doesn't explain God away. Instead, the growing beauty and complexity and, and, uh, t and um, awesomeness and terror, you, know, you could say, of science's revelations further affirms God's existence. We see infinite mouths, eyes, and stomachs of the cosmic aspect, yet they continue to be part of the cosmic aspect. They continue to be of the one God. So did quality create God, or does quality allow us to see God? However we frame it, that is, that is a question for our time. We can, we can be ideological. We can be divided, we can oppose each other, or we can extend a loving hand to other people, as Mary said in video two. And I think that's what we're doing here. And that needs that, rather than the ideological separation, that needs to be the substrate of our consciousness going forward because we now need to, uh, let's just say, lay the foundation of artificial intelligence. And how are we going to do that? Is it going to be one of divisiveness or is it going to be one of extending a hand, one that can take us all in the right direction? So I hope that made sense, and I will see you next time.